um, we, we started or ended last week with the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. And that seemed as if it was a very hopeless situation. Very depressing. But we understand that Jesus has the final say. Amen. Nothing is over until God says so. Amen. Amen. And so in chapter 24, um, Jesus' awful get on the cross was not the end of the story. Within three days, he rose from the dead. We see um, Luke 24 starts with a narration of the, the woman uh, arriving early in the morning at the sepulchre, bringing spices that they had prepared to embalm the body of Jesus. You could say this is similar today with you know, people bringing flowers to the gravesite to show their love and affection um, and respect for the deceased. But when they arrived at the sepulcher, to their surprise, the stone was rolled away from the entrance. Um, in, in the other um, um, Gospels, we're told that they were very concerned about who was going to roll away the stone. So this wasn't a small stone. And in fact, we understand that guards were placed there to secure it so that nobody essentially could go in without them knowing. But as I said, God's plans are different. Amen. God had other plans. And so when they got there, the stone was rolled away. Now I want to make it clear that the stone wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out. It was actually for people to be able to get in and see that he was no longer there, that he, had, he, was, he, that he was raised from the dead, just like he said. And so the woman went expecting to accomplish their task with their spices, and in fact, these tombs were large enough so that people could walk in and, and, and be able to observe stuff. But when they got there, they could not find the body of Jesus. Now they were perplexed. They were shocked. Probably wondering what had happened. Amen. And uh, the Lord, or, or two angels, we're told, appeared unto them. The Bible says that they were in shining or dazzling garments. And this frightened the woman. They, were, they became afraid. Amen. And they reacted in humility, bowing down themselves before the angels. And I want you to look at what he said to them. The Bible says here, it says, why seek ye the living among the dead? I'm going to paraphrase that and, and say it this way. Why are you looking in the tomb for someone who is alive? He's not here. He has risen from the dead. The angel reminded them about what Jesus told them before that he was going to, actually he said this three times to the followers, to the disciples, that he was going to be crucified, he was going to be buried, and then he would raise again on the third day. And at this point, they remembered what Jesus had said. Basically, you could say everything came together. It all clicked. And so they left the sepulcher um, in haste, um, to tell the, the other disciples and other followers about what had happened. We are told that, um, you know, the, the, among the women were Mary Magdalene. This is uh, the lady that Jesus has cast out seven devils. There was Johanna, the Mary the mother of James, Salome, and other unnamed women. And so these women brought back the good news to the other disciples. One thing to that I want to bring across today is that based on Jewish laws, women were not or could not act as witnesses. And this point is going to be get very important. It, you see here how Jesus, we understand that our belief, what we do, is not based on tradition. Jesus is not concerned about tradition, right? And in fact, you see, as, as we have seen several times throughout the book of Luke, that Jesus actually elevated women, um, right? And so here they were selected as the, 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 the ones to bear this good news. But the disciples certainly did not believe it. They actually, the Bible actually uh, pointed to the fact that they thought that this was kind of nonsense in a, in a way. There are many skeptics that tries to 
um, write off the resurrection as if uh, and, and say it's a made up story by a group of overzealous disciples. But in fact, if you look at the account in the book of Luke, it's the exact opposite. They were not anxiously looking for any reason to believe that he had arisen. In s they weren't anticipating it. In fact, they refused to, to believe without concrete evidence. Even the missing body itself wasn't enough to convince them of his, his, his resurrection. The, the other piece, too, is, you know, if you were trying to, to convey a, a, um, a others um, of this, you, s you certainly wouldn't use a woman or w women as witnesses, right? So, so um, anyway, let's move on. And so, Pete, the next thing we see here is that, um, so I think I'm going ahead of myself here, is um, uh, Peter basically went to check it out for himself. So he went to the tomb, went in, and of course, he found the same thing. There was no body. Even though Jesus had predicted his resurrection, we find that none of his believers really believed it would happen. I could say, you know, today that the resurrection stands as a foundational um, uh, it's very foundational to our Christian faith. We can have complete confidence that Jesus is alive and that he's guiding us through his Holy Spirit. We're told, that the Bible says that if the same uh, spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in us, it will quicken or make alive our mortal bodies. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to every Christian today. And it can bring every spiritually dead person back to life. Amen. If we, if we act upon the word of God, if we have faith in Jesus, we, we understand that other religion has strong ethical systems, concept about paradise and the afterlife. Some even have quote-unquote holy scriptures. But we find only in Christianity that God manifested himself in flesh, became human, died for his people, and was raised again in power and glory to rule his church. This is the only, only religion that we see we, that this, this is foundational to what we believe. So I, I'd ask a question today. Why is, why is the resurrection so important? We know that death had been conquered. And we too can be raised from the dead to live forever with Christ if we live our life faithfully according to the scripture according to the word of God. It also gives authority to the, the witness of the church. Amen. We know that what we're saying is not hearsay. It's real. It's reality. Amen. It also gives meaning to the Lord's Supper because we, we know the Bible tells us that we should do it often in remembrance of him. Right? And so it's, it's reality. It's true. The other thing that I, that I thought about today is that this was such, his, his death, his crucifixion was such a tragedy. It was so horrific. But out of this came something so great, so important. And I thought, you know, we can find meaning in great tragedy. We can find meaning in great tragedy. We, we understand that prior to this, the spirit of, of, of souls, amen, um, we're in a place of um, uh, a place where they temporarily await the final resurrection. We c people call it Hades or Shoal. Um, but with Jesus dying, we understand based on the book of Revelation 1, verse 17, that he took the keys of death and hell. The enemy no longer has power. Amen. Jesus, because of his death, because of his resurrection, he took the keys of hell and death. Amen. The book of Luke is, uh, I think, the only um, gospel that went into great detail about the encounter of Jesus and two followers on the road to Damascus. 
these two men were walking, likely on Sunday, seven miles journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We're not told why they were heading there. It could have been, you know, where they're from. Amen. Little is known about these two men except one was called Cleopas. And during their walk, they were talking about everything that had transpired over the past few days. They were so caught up in their discussion that they didn't even recognize that someone had drew near to them. This was, in fact, Jesus. And he was walking in the same direction with them. Jesus then began to ask them, why, why are you guys so concerned? What make, make you guys so sad, so depressed, so hopeless? And Cleopatra answered him, I would say in, in, in a sort of weird way, like, are you from around here? Where have you been? Under the rock, so to speak? Amen. How can you not know about what has, what has happened? And Jesus again asked him, you know, what, what happened? Amen. And so he began to, to talk about what had transpired um, over the past few days. They began to say how Jesus was delivered to the Romans by the chief priests and the soldiers. I, I think one thing is made clear here by, by what they were saying is that even though the Romans were the one that executed Jesus, the blame really was on the Jews and the religious folks because they were the ones who, who, who arrested him and delivered him to the, the, um, the Romans. They also began to talk about Jesus, how he was a, a great prophet, amen, how he had done um, miracles and he was a mighty teacher. But one thing that I, I, I deem important here was that they still believed, had this idea that Jesus would rescue them from Roman rule. They certainly did not realize that Jesus had come to redeem people from the slavery, from slavery to sin. And so these men, because Jesus had died, they had lost hope. They were walking aimlessly. I, 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 could, I could imagine that they were completely depressed because they had placed all their hope, all their confidence in Jesus. And now he was gone. One thing that we need to realize and understand, this is after he was resurrected. So likely they had, they had heard news that he was risen from the dead, but again, we see a lack of belief. So they were hopeless, they were downcast, amen. But we see Jesus then begin to talk to them, amen. And he, in fact, Jesus called them foolish because all of this was written in the word of the Lord, amen. He had already told them, person, not, maybe not these two men, but the disciples, what was going to happen. The prophets talk about the fact that even the psalm with David, that about what would happen, and so um, Jesus said that they were foolish because they failed to understand that his suffering was his path to glory. This was a part of his plan. Amen. This was his plan to redeem man from sin. Amen. And so basically, they, you could say that they missed the significance of probably one of the most important or greatest event in, in human history because they were so focused on their disappointment and on their problems. They even didn't recognize Jesus when he came close to them as well. One thing that I find very interesting is like there were a number of believers that were in Jerusalem. But yet we find these two walking away opposite direction from Jerusalem doing their own thing, I would say. And you're saying, Brother Greg, why, why are you saying that? It's... As Christians, we need to be careful because we can miss what the Lord is doing. When we withdraw, when we withdraw ourselves from the strength of, that we found um, amongst ourselves as believers, if we become so preoccupied with our dashed hope, frustrated plans, we can miss what the Lord is trying to do in our life. And so it's important, if you think about it, the natural thing that they should have been doing 
would be coming together, helping each other through this period. But these two were, I don't know, you could say going back home or whatever. But, but, but I wanted to, to remember this because you're going to see something important that happened and, and what it did to them, how it changed their, the way they were thinking, where they were going. So as I have to say um, here that <laughs> twice we, we see this in the, in, in the book of Luke 24 where Jesus began to teach um, his disciples or followers and, and help them to understand the scripture. And both of these occasions, they shared a meal. I don't know if something about eating, um, what it does to your brain, but we know that's not it. But, but clearly, we see Jesus chose this path. And I, I, I would think that when you share a meal with somebody, it, it, give, it, it builds some connection, some openness that, that, that allow people to, 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 to listen, want to understand, whatever. So it's something that's good for us to do today. I mean, we, we try to do that, but we, there is there's, there's, um, precedent here, right? Um, this is what Jesus did. And so as they shared a meal, um, we, 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 Jesus blessed what they were doing, and he began to talk to them. And the Bible says that immediately their eyes were open, and they recognized him. It's based on him teaching them the word, breaking of bread, and immediately Jesus disappeared from them. I think it's important. That something that's very clear to me this morning is that these men were perplexed. They were hopeless. And uh, us as Christians, when we find ourselves in that position, it's important for us to go to the scripture and find help. Not to look for somebody that agrees with you or whatever, but we see here what Jesus did. These men were, these men were perplexed. They were hopeless. And Jesus began to talk to them about the scripture. They began to talk about the word of the Lord. Amen. And, and, and that changed their situation. Amen. These two men, um, they, they, they said that their, their hearts, so it, it did something to them. They said their, it stirred their hearts when they were talking to Jesus. And so we see that the presence of the Lord changed their mood from despair and gloom and it brought them hope. Their doubts were dispelled. This likely was late at night. And, and we see that early on they, they actually implored Jesus to stay with them because it was getting the evening and he shouldn't be traveling alone. But this good news was so exciting that they didn't wait. They didn't wait until morning to get back to the disciples. So they immediately set out to Jerusalem from um, Emmaus, like I said, it was seven or eight miles. Um, and when they got there, they were told that Jesus had appeared unto Peter as well. I, I find it really, really um, interesting. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's interesting. When you open your heart to Jesus, and when, you have, when, you, when you're concerned about him and what he's doing, he's going to help you. Because we, we know that Peter, I can't imagine how he would have felt when he denied Jesus. But because the Jesus cared so much about him, he was one of the persons that he appeared to. Peter repented, and we see that God would use him, um, would forgive him, or God forgave him, and he would be a, 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 a leader in building the church. I, um, I believe in the book of Corinthians, it is, it is said that Jesus appeared unto over 500 believers. So there were many witnesses um, of, of, of his res resurrection. So the, the disciples now were gathered together in Jerusalem, probably talking about all that had happened. And, and Jesus appeared unto them. They were, they were very frightened. The Bible says that they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus said, you know, be calm, peace be still. It's not a ghost, it's me. In fact, he told them to look at him, to touch him, so that they could to, to, to realize that it was truly, was truly him. Again, we see here where, where Jesus, um, in fact, he asked them something to eat as well, right? Um, so that, you know, it's 
to show that he's not a ghost. Um, and again, we see here that Jesus, again, opened the minds of his disciples so that they could understand the scripture. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. The, the disciples, when Jesus appeared to them, they, they thought it was too good to be true. This can't be, this can't be happening for real. And so Jesus asked him for food, and he ate a piece of, the Bible said, broiled fish, honeycomb, and demonstrate that truly this was a human, that he, it was real, that he came back to life. And he began to tell them that everything that was written by the prophets, by Moses, it's coming to pass. His words, what he said was, was true, it's, it's coming to pass. And You know, I've read this scripture many a times, Luke 24, verse 45. And I, I think it's very foolish when people begin to talk about the salvation plan baptism and, s and, and make a statement that, well, Peter is the one who says in Acts 2 and 38 that we should baptize in Jesus' name. The Bible says that Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scripture. Jesus wanted them to know clearly what to do. And so he, he made sure that there was no confusion. It was clear what they should do. So he opened their understanding so that they would understand the scripture. The other thing too is Jesus knew what Peter was going to do. So we're tell, you're telling me that the one who created the heaven and the earth know the past, the present, the future, knew what Peter was going to do, made a mistake, that's just, that's just very silly. Really silly. So the Bible says that he opened their understanding that they may understand scripture. And he said, thus it's written, and thus it's behoved Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, what's his name? Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's going to start in Jerusalem. I, um, I have often said that there are times when I'm, 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 I'm looking for a way to, to make or synthesize a particular compound. And the, the procedure is very long. And so after a while, people no longer write out all the information. They would say, use a method that was developed by Gonzalez, for example, in such and such a year, and with the, the, the site, how you find it. And you'll, you'll see that in many different um, um, writings. And so you have to go back to find exactly how it should be done. If you want to understand baptism, you got to go to the beginning at Jerusalem. I, I'm, I'm so thankful for the revelation of the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm, I'm so thankful. That's why it's really not a good idea to just pick out a particular scripture. The Bible says, here's a little, there's a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. That, this is the only, I don't understand, well, I do understand, it's the work of the enemy. That, that's, that's why we have all of these different um, um, interpretations. It's the work of the enemy because he's trying to cause confusion. But there doesn't need to be any confusion because if you follow the word of God, it says clearly what, how we should do this. When it's going to start, how it's going to be done. So we have to go to the book of Acts to see that. says, you guys are going to be witnesses of these things. You're going to see it. You're going to tell others about it. You're going to testify about it. The, the good thing is that even though Jesus was about to leave them, he didn't leave them comfortless. He made a promise to them that they're not going to have to go through all of this life all by themselves. That in Jerusalem, they're going to be, they're going to receive power. 
Not any power. The Holy Ghost power. Power from on high. The one who, all, who has all the power in heaven and in earth. He's going to give, empower them. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have the Holy Ghost, you got power. You have power. Stop letting the enemy lie to you. One of the things that I try to do, or, or said it this way, I um, at one point I was trying to get some things accomplished, and I didn't think I had the authority to do it. So I talked to the folks that were in charge, and they said, you know, Greg, I think you have more power than, 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 you, than, 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 than you, you know. They're like, you, you can influence these folks because what I've seen is that when you ask these folks to do certain things, they do it. One, because you have been very helpful and they know that you're going to be looking at it. So he's like, I think you will get much further than if I ask. I'm like, I got power. Well, I'm going to use it. Church, we got power. Use the power that we have. Use the influence that you have. You know, when I, was, when I was a lot younger, I used to be scared to talk to folks. Especially about the salvation plan. But why? Why am I scared? I have power. And if they're refusing, they're not refusing me. They're refusing Jesus. We, th we don't need to be scared. There are people out there that, are, that have their crazy belief, and they're not afraid. They're talking here like, are you for real? Well, we are for real. This God that we serve is real. His power is real. He can change lives. There's miraculous power in the name of Jesus. So they we're not going to have to do this all by themselves, but they were going to receive the comforter, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus um, walked, talked with the believers, the followers, um, on the way to Bethany, which is uh, uh, in the slopes of the Mount of Olives, and he blessed them and while he was doing so, his physical presence left the disciple. But we understand that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, would soon come and empower them. If you read the book of Acts, as it talks about the encounter with the followers, or, or this specific um, Jesus being taken away from them, the Bible begins to tell us that they were, they stood there gazing. They'd be in awe of what had transpired. And the angel of the Lord came to them and says, why are you standing gazing? This same Jesus that is taken away from you is going to return. I'm so glad that we know for a fact that he's going to return. I have I've heard this preach from when I was very young. In fact, my, my grandmother, I remember um, very early on, she told me, I, I don't think I'm going to live um, or, or the Lord is going to return by, by the age of 20. She's like, I don't know when, but that's just my, 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 my belief or my feeling because when I look at what is transpiring around me, it can't be long. Well, I would say if we think about it today, that's even much more true than back then. We can't go on for much longer the way things are in our society, in the world. And that's why it's important that as Christians, we don't get caught up 
in the cares of this life. We don't allow that to pull us down and to, 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 to decrease our faith in Jesus. Because the Bible says, if in this life only we have hope, then we are men most miserable. Our hope is in glory. Jesus is the hope of glory. The Bible says that we're looking for a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. We, we know that the Bible tells us, I believe in the book of John, that Jesus tells us that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And he tells us again that he's going to return. After the angel spoke unto these followers, we are told that they begin to worship the Lord and they return to Jerusalem with great joy and that they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. I mean, in closing this morning, the, the gospel of Luke portrayed Jesus as the perfect example of a life lived according to God's plan. He was not a phantom human. He was real. He healed people. He fed them. He was concerned about their physical health, but more about the state of their souls. Today, as, as Christians, we need to live our life according to the word of the Lord, according to God's plan. We need to obey his words in every detail. We need to be seeking to win souls for the kingdom of God, to restore people to receive this great salvation message. We have a job to do, church. I, I was meditating, I don't know if it was yesterday um, or Friday, and, and God just began to deal with me in a, in a couple of different areas. One was, I began to talk to my wife, and I said, you know, I think we need to make some time as a family to reach out to folks. There are too many people that are hopeless and need an answer. And as a family, I think we need to do that. We're going to come up with a plan. This, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to do this, but I felt instructed from the Holy Ghost that we need to do this. The other thing that the Lord said to me is, you are limiting yourself. And I said, limiting myself? He said, yeah. You're not praying enough. You're not fasting enough. I have so much more for you, so much more power, so much more authority. But in order to, to attain it, you got to pray more. You got to fast more. You know, the Bible tells us that this can't go, it's not, but by prayer and fasting. I'm saying that, church, because I know there's a lot going on in our lives. I know we need to provide for a family. I know our lives are busy. But we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be disciples. We're called to be soul winners. And somehow... We need to get that front and center again. Somehow that needs to be a priority in our life. If we truly believe that our hope is in glory, if we truly believe the salvation message, then we need to do more to share it. We need to do more to be a witness. And I'm not, I'm not chastising any, anyone. This is just what I feel in the Holy Ghost, that as a church, we got to embrace this more. As a church, we need to take more action in this area. Because God, God has given us promises, right? We all know about it. And his promises are sure. So if things are not happen, happening, it's not because of God. It's because we're not doing what we're supposed to. I, I remember God speaking to me um, at one point, and he said, it's time to shine, meaning both in in, in, in in work area as well as as um in living for him. 
But that didn't happen without me doing or taking specific action. I ha- there's something that I had to do in order for God to open certain doors, certain, certain avenues for me. And so if you want God to work in your, in your life, we got to take action. We've got to take action. If, if you begin to study and look at all the, the different miracles that happen, we see in so many instances that there had to be a step of faith. There had to be a belief in God. I am somebody who completely believe in Jesus. I believe in the power that lies in the name of Jesus. I have no doubt. No, does it mean that I get everything that I want? No. But when I'm, when I'm in the valley, it, it, it's very simple for me. I'm like, God, I trust you. And if this is what you have for me, I'm okay. And maybe you're trying to teach me something. Maybe you're trying to grow me. I don't go get upset with God because I don't have what I want or don't get what I want. The same way as parents, when our kids ask us for stuff, we don't give them everything. We know the things that are good for them. We know that maybe it's not time. Maybe they need to wait. Well, we need to trust God with, we need to place our trust in God the same way. I've said this before, one of my favorite scripture is trust in the Lord. Not with some, but with all of that heart. Lean not to that own understanding. Or, or understanding at times can cause us to not get what we need to because we are so trying to figure it out. How is this going to work? I, I mentioned on Wednesday night that I got an increase at the wrong time of the year in the middle of them laying people off. Because I was like, God, like, you know, things are kind of getting tight. You know, with these uh, pretty high um, tuition that I'm paying, <laughs> I need a little bit more room, Lord. That, that's just what I said. But trust in the Lord, church. Trust in the Lord. And by trusting him, it means that we're going to have to do what he says. If he says that we need to be witnesses, then trust him and be a witness. No, you know, we all don't, well, I don't, so um, we, we don't need to, to, to know the Bible back and forth to be a witness. The, the easiest or the simplest thing to do is just tell somebody what God did for you. How did God change your life? How did he bring you from a state of hopelessness? Where you now have hope, where you now have joy. You have the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's, that's, that's the simplest thing. And even giving a Bible study, the best way to learn is to do it. Don't get caught up in, oh, I don't know all of this. The best way to do it, and you know what? I, I've made a mistake. I'm like, why did I? Oh, my goodness. Like, Greg, what were you thinking? That's not the way to do it. And uh, let me say this. This is, this is not the right way to do it, but I'm just going to tell you how God is. I had a Bible study once, and I didn't prepare myself the way I should pastor. Um, I didn't pray as much as I should. I didn't study as much as I should. But I said, God, you know what? Lord, I, I need your help. Jab in there is like, God, I'm sorry. But I need your help. It's one of the best Bible studies that I did. Because you know what happened? is that I wasn't so caught up in something that was written, but as, be, as I began to talk to this person, I started talking about what I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I discovered was that God was dealing with this person. And what this person needed, their faith needed to be built. And so I began to testify about how God moved in my life. By the time I get to talking about baptism, the person was ready. Because that's what he was looking for. He understood the need to get baptized, but he didn't quite sh- understand how this was going to work. And so what he needed was for his faith to be built, that this is real. 
right? And that by, by following what Jesus said is how it's going to work out. So I, I, I'm not telling you to do that, but we need to be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord when we're talking to people. We need to, right? Sometimes we're too, we're too in a rush to when, like, sometimes they don't know anything. Build a, re- build a relationship with them so that when you get to, 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 to the scripture, they're more open to receive what you have to say. Amen. We're going to start with that this morning. I'm, I'm so thankful for the word of the Lord. And I, I pray that, you know, this is doing just as much for you as it did for me um, in reading and studying the word of the Lord. Um, the word of the Lord is, it, it just, it can change your, your mentality. Not can, it will, if you, if you approach it the right way. And just ask God to, to help you, right? The first time around, you may not understand it, but seek God, and, and he, will, he will help you. Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, for your, for your word this morning, Lord. God, you have given us a commission, God, uh, uh, to, to, to be a witness, God, to, to our world, God. God, let us not be weary, God, in well-doing, God. But, Lord, let this be, God, front and center in our mind, God. And let us take action, God, and be a witness, um, and testify of your goodness to others, Lord. God, there are so many that are lost without you. There are so many, God, without hope. God, you are the hope of glory. You have the answer, Lord. God, I pray that you will use us as your hands, as your feet, as your mouthpiece, God. Let us not be afraid, God, to tell others about you. God, we give you thanks and praise this morning. Bless, God, what we're about to partake of, God, and allow us to come back, God, with the right mindset, God, to lift up, to magnify your great and mighty name. We say thanks in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen.